As the world continues to lock down due to the coronavirus pandemic, VPNs have never been more important. For millions around the world, working from home is the new norm for the foreseeable future, causing organizations to quickly spin up and scale out VPNs to meet the high demand of the new remote workforce. With VPNs being one of the most obvious entry points inside our network, a poorly designed VPN rollout can have catastrophic implications. For today's video, I've rounded up some of the best practice advice from CISA, NIST, and personal experience to give you these six considerations for securing your VPN. But before we jump into the video, it's worth mentioning also that there are alternatives to VPN. You may want to check out my previous video entitled Accomplishing Zero Trust Security Using SDP to look at a different approach for accessing protected content on your network. That being said, let's dive right into the list. 2019 was a bad year for VPN vendors. Some of the biggest firewall and VPN vendors were plagued by vulnerabilities throughout the year, leading CISA to release several advisories of the vulnerable products and the impact to enterprises. In fact, the NSA and UK's National Cybersecurity Center reported that APT groups have been exploiting these disclosed vulnerabilities throughout the year. That's why the first item on our list is to patch any vulnerable VPNs in your network. Due to the severity of these advisories, our first point is the most time sensitive. So before all else, make sure your VPN appliance and endpoint software is not affected by any of the CVEs or CISA advisories on the screen, which I'll link also below. If it is, prioritize patching those systems as soon as possible. That means both the VPN appliance and endpoints that they use to connect as well. Both could have been affected depending on the vendor. Automated scanning bots can quickly sniff out and easily detect these vulnerable systems to be exploited later, so make sure that that's prioritized. In fact, Bad Packet reports showed a massive uptick in scanning for these vulnerabilities towards the end of 2019 and well into 2020. Number two, use secure VPN protocols. VPN encryption technologies generally come in two different flavors, IPsec or SSL. And while both of these are considered generally safe, the reality is that SSL and IPsec encompass a lot of different encryption algorithms, some of which are outdated and considered unsafe to use. For example, the term SSL is generally used interchangeably with TLS, but the actual SSL protocol is old, vulnerable, and should not be used under any circumstances. In fact, all versions of SSL, TLS 1.0, and TLS 1.1 should not be used for VPN deployment. That's because they are susceptible to the Poodle vulnerability. And it's not enough to simply not use these protocols, they must be disabled or not supported altogether. Because of the nature of the Poodle attacks, they work by exploiting backwards compatibility to these older versions. While IPsec is less commonly used for endpoint connections, here are some best practice advice when choosing configurations for your setup. Use Ike version 2 whenever possible. Avoid weak encryption algorithms like DES or triple DES. Avoid weak hashing algorithms like MD5 or SHA-1. And avoid Diffie-Hellman groups 1 and 2. Number three, multi-factor authentication. One of the quickest and most effective measures you can take right now to harden your VPN is by enabling multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor means that users are required to enter their password and another form of verification, such as something they possess like a token or smartphone or something that they are like a fingerprint or retina scanner. For VPN multi-factor authentication, a common choice is to use a token-based system where the user possesses either a key fob or an electronic app on their smartphone that displays the keys to enter once they've successfully entered their password. Try to avoid email as a form of multi-factor authentication. Anyone that's already compromised a user account can most likely also have access to their email as well. And while token-based systems are not infallible, they are highly effective and very inexpensive. Number four, certificates. Certificate-based authentication serves as an additional form of verification for your VPN clients. Certificates provide verification for both the user and the corporation that users are connecting to. A user certificate can be revoked if an account becomes compromised, while a device certificate can be revoked if a device is lost or stolen, preventing someone who's gotten their hands on the device from brute forcing or trying to log in as a separate username. While certificates protect the corporation from unauthorized device connections into the network, they also protect the user from potential man-in-the-middle attacks. Without certificates, a simple DNS redirect is all an attacker would need to redirect a client's VPN connection to his or her own server without any form of verification from the client. Number five, network segmentation. As part of good cybersecurity hygiene, we always strive to have segmentation wherever possible, and this extends especially to remote users. That means keep your VPN users in a separate IP space, using a separate WAN IP from the rest of your corporate network, and not allowing any intrazone traffic. A really bad practice is using an IP range that's already in use in your network, or worse, VPNing users behind a NATed device. 
VPN users should be easily identifiable in network logs by having their own network IP space. That also means users cannot communicate to each other unless they've explicitly been allowed to. The idea here is that number one, users always go through an inspection device like a firewall. Number two, it allows you to apply security inspection per firewall policy, for example, enabling DLP or antivirus for users talking to a network share. And lastly, you can also log and detect potential abuse from users in that network space using a SIM. A good use case for this last point is to do geolocation detection using a SIM. That means that if a user traditionally logs in, say, via Atlanta, Georgia, but then randomly logs in through Beijing, an alert should go off that the account was compromised and should be automatically quarantined. Number six, no split tunneling. VPN connectivity has two fundamental methods, tunnel mode and split tunneling. In tunnel mode, once a user has connected to the VPN, all their traffic is routed through the VPN. In split mode, only network you have specified will be routed through the tunnel and into your corporate network. The latter sounds tempting because you lower the throughput requirements at your corporate edge. However, using split tunneling, you've also bridged two networks, the untrusted internet from your client and your corporate network. And if your employees are in a particularly unsecured network, like say a coffee shop, this becomes an even bigger issue. Always opt for tunnel mode wherever possible. Treat outgoing web traffic just as you would any corporate traffic and keep security policies the same unilaterally. Always be particularly cautious of any traffic that comes inside the network from the VPN. So that does it for this video, guys, and I hope that everyone is being safe. Please visit us at thecisoperspective.com, and as always, please comment, hit like, subscribe to stay on top of our latest releases here at the CISO Perspective.